好，接下来要用英文演讲了。嗯、um, ，With my greatest honor, I would like to welcome our next keynote speaker, Dr. Thomas Finger. Dr. Finger is the Octagon Roland Distinguished Fellow and Senior Scholar. In 2009, he was the Payne Distinguished Lecturer at Stanford University. From May 2005 through December 2008, he served as the first Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Analysis. And concurrently, as chairman of the National Intelligence Council, also Dr. Finger has previously served as assistant secretary for the State Department of Bureau of Intelligence and Research. Dr. Finger is a leader, an innovator, and an intelligence reformer. With no more, no further ado, let's all welcome Dr. Finger. Thank you. It's, a, it's truly an honor to be asked to speak twice to this group, first on the panel and now as a, as a keynoter. The topic of my talk this afternoon is China's rise, <coughs> excuse me, and the global system. China's rise may be among the most frequently noted phenomena of the 21st century. It's a starting point for lots of discussions. For some, it is the bottom line end of discussion. China is rising as if that somehow has explained a great deal. Projected specific consequences, raised specific fears, quieted concerns. China's peaceful rise, harmonious rise. The adjectives used、uh, underscore both the importance and the uncertainty of the subject. There's a great deal of interest. There's a great deal of uncertainty. There are obviously a great many implications, and even a larger number of imputed implications, inevitable consequences. Of what China's rise means for China, for governance in China, for the Chinese people, for Northeast Asian region, for the United States, for the global system. It's a set of questions that could occupy us all afternoon, all day, into tomorrow, and undoubtedly will occupy scholars for years and. Probably decades to come. I think that's the time scale under which this will play out. I want to look briefly this afternoon at two questions, two dimensions. The first has to do with the relationship between the global system and China's rise. Oversimplifying the question greatly, to what extent has the global system facilitated? China's rise, the accomplishments of the last three decades, and the flip side of it: to what extent has the global system, led by the United States, impeded China's rise? Would China have done much better were it not for the character, the concerns, the constraints inherent in joining an existing global system? The second, equally broad and equally mass multifaceted question that I want to raise this afternoon to stimulate thinking: Is has China's rise changed the global system more than engagement with the global system has changed China? And one could ask specific variants of that. Has China's engagement with the United States changed China more, or changed the United States more? These are, in one sense, parlor game questions. They don't have a specific answer. They can be played out. You can construct an argument. And yet, I fundamentally am an empiricist. I think, end of the day, facts matter. 
and having as accurate an understanding of what has happened, why it has happened, how it has happened, what lessons have been learned, what new relationships, what new possibilities have been put in place, is just terribly important to formulating policies that will ensure continued peace, prosperity, and open new areas of mutual benefit. Let me turn first to China's rise and the global system. I will simply assert that China's rise since 1978, the advent of opening and reform, was made possible by participation in the global system. That if one had to find a bumper sticker to characterize Chinese approaches to modernization and development for the previous 30 years, for the previous 100 years, I think that bumper sticker would have to say something like, tried unproven methods and failed. The precise approaches from the Tungja restoration through Maoist experimentation were different. What they had in common was an assumption that China was unique. China was different in ways that had to be preserved that were superior and could find a way to become, again, rich, prosperous, and influential that didn't look like the paths, the strategies pursued by others. The key change that comes with Deng Xiaoping, no more experimentation. Let's do what has proven to work in the region, in the developed world, and at other times, short periods of China's history. Deng's determination, the political circumstances in the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution that made that possible, still would not have worked without the other side of the equation. The willingness of the Carter administration to welcome China into a global system. It's a change that goes far beyond the enemy of my enemy is my friend strategy that brought the United States and China together under Nixon and Mao. China was the first country invited into what was then known as the free world to participate in that global system, then the system of the United States and its allies, without having to change politically, without having to become an ally. China and the United States had, at the time had very different expectations about how that would play out. But the opportunity seized was one of taking advantage of the stability, the predictability, the markets, the wealth, the technology, the education systems that had been developed in many respects after the Second World War as part of the Cold War strategy. Good leadership in China wise decisions, not so often noted wise leadership in the United States, consistent policies across very different administrations that kept the policies in place on both sides long enough to begin to have concrete benefits that built up momentum, that built up lessons and interests and capabilities to keep it going. It became a machine that sustained itself. 
It wasn't just the United States, though. This was not about China and the United States. It's the global system. But the global system of today, it's important to remember, was the free world system of 30 years ago. What China joined, what China took advantage of, was not simply American markets and money and technology and universities. It was Europe. It was Japan. It was South Korea. It's parts of Southeast Asia. If it had simply been a bilateral relationship of perhaps transient mutual interest between Washington and Beijing, it would be much less successful, much less significant than what has happened. Because as China interacted with nations of Europe, other countries in East Asia, sort of the what are the norms, the values, the requirements of market systems, of dealing with more open political systems, of rule-based interactions. What was encountered was more or less the same answer, more or less the same requirements, more or less the same array of opportunities everywhere. This minimized the ability to play one foreign, one barbarian against another um, in the way of you know, a once tried and failed Chinese strategy. But it also made for consistency. It made once, show, once lessons were learned, how do you deal with the capitalist market? How do you deal with public opinion? How do you deal with democratic systems where you get turnover of parties and personnel. Once that lesson was learned, it was widely applicable. It made it a lot easier for China to do this. Again, I'm not taking away from the accomplishment. There are a lot of countries that didn't get into the game and didn't learn it, didn't learn it until very late. Despite 30 years of history and experience and accumulation of lessons, accumulation of mutual interests. As I indicated to those who have been sworn, there's still quite difference in perception as to whether this is a transitory phenomenon that the door or the window, whatever image you want, will stay open only for a limited period of time so China ought to take advantage of it for the climate changes. or viewed from the West or the United States, but the West more broadly, is China really becoming a part of this global system with a stake in the system? Or is it only using it up to a point that it can discard it, break with it? And the slogans around Beijing consensus take on meanings far beyond what I think was originally intended. Is there an alternative model of modernization, self-strengthening, attainment of leadership in the global system that is different than the existing global system? My judgment is no. That China hasn't developed an alternative way. China has developed a way within the existing global system that is unique exactly to the extent that every nation's experience is unique in working within a larger system. What's the magnitude of the impact? What difference did it make in 1978 when, in essence, Carter opened the door and Deng Xiaoping decided to walk through it? And then a series of leaders have continued. Well, w one obvious point is that China has changed dramatically. I first started dealing with China in 1965, before the Cultural Revolution. I first started interacting directly in 1972 with ping pong. 
It, it's like being dropped into a different universe today than it was there on every dimension. And from my perspective as a, an American, virtually all of this change is positive. From the perspective of Chinese friends, many of whom now I've had for three decades, it's also overwhelmingly positive. There are things that you know, are not as nice as they were, maybe more, more greed than there used to be, uh, less attention to public good and more attention to private good. But on the whole, it's been worth it. It's going in the right direction. Want to protect it. I think of my own country. How much has the United States changed in that three decades? It was actually changed quite a bit. But that change has had almost nothing to do with China. It's had more to do with us becoming more true to our ideals, realizing more of our own potential, overcoming some of the defects in our own society. But think really at the global level, the global system. How much has that changed since 1978? Again, very, very large magnitude of change, very little of which has to do with China. And let me just illustrate that by, by making obvious points. The Cold War ended. It ended because the Soviet Union collapsed. It didn't end because of something that China did, something China and the United States did together beyond that Nixon-Mao shared strategic interests that put constraints on Moscow. The global system that in 1978 was pretty much limited to the U.S., its allies, and then China, is now truly global. Almost every country is in. And the ones that are not in have made the choice, like North Korea, to stay out. It truly is a global system, not merely rhetorically a global system. The world is more prosperous today than ever. More people in more countries are more prosperous than at any time in history, and the projection is prosperity will continue. Unfortunately, inequality is also growing despite the dramatic lowering of instances of poverty, for which China does get in a disproportionate amount of credit. The world has reduced poverty or raised out of the less than one dollar a day per capita hundreds of millions of people, almost all of whom live in two countries, China and India. This is a tremendous accomplishment that has changed the world. The more prosperous people can buy more things, can, they're healthier, they can uh, take better advantage of education. The global system is larger. It's more integrated. It's more interdependent. With all of the frictions and possibilities that that entails. China's a part of it an ever-increasing part of it, and increasingly playing a causal role, a leading role, or a must-be-consulted role, as opposed to being swept along on decisions made elsewhere. The transformation of other states. I think this is important. The Soviet Union is gone. Russia participates in the global system. The Warsaw Pact is gone. Former Warsaw Pact states are part of the European Union. Brazil and India, the non-aligned movement, Indonesia, that opted out of the Cold War struggle have joined the global system. Say, almost everybody's in. What's different for a lot of the other big players, certainly the other BRICs, is China had a 10-year head start. 10 years 
to climb the learning curve, for foreign investment to now have sunk costs in China, for Chinese businessmen to learn how to interact, again, not with the United States, with that global system. That advantage has helped propel China forward. But it's a waning advantage. Others are catching up. They're learning lessons from China's engagement in the global system. There's going to be a lot more competition at a time when there are higher expectations in China and for where it was going to go. I want to close by addressing the erroneously often cited balance beam theory of history. Uh, the rise of country A means the decline of country B. In this case, China's rise, U.S. decline. If one comes at it empirically, that's not what one finds. It's not what I find, certainly looking at numbers. This morning in the panel, Mike Lampton made reference to the overwhelming preeminence of the United States immediately after World War II. Last country standing without serious damage and had almost 50 percent of the world economy. That truly was anomalous. Go back to 1979, when China joined the global system. U.S. share of global economic activity had dropped 26 percent. Recovery of Europe, recovery of Japan, rise of the Asian tigers, the little tigers, 26 percent. China comes in. China has had the phenomenal success that we've talked about today and is properly talked about very often. Achieving now the status of a gross domestic product equal to that of Japan with the necessary footnote with 10 times as many people. But 30 years of engagement has changed the global system, the composition of it, the accomplishments. The global economy is many, many times larger than it was. But it hasn't been a balance beam. China has gone up and the linchpin, once upon a time of the global system, no longer in the same way, the United States has gone down. And let me just put one more statistic out there. In 2009, after 30 years of China's rise, the rise of the BRICS, the end of the Cold War, all of those things, U.S. share of a much larger global economy had decreased. It's now 24.5 percent. But over that 30-year period, on a per capita basis, it actually went up. Because the U.S. as a share of global population fell from 5 to 4 percent. In that same period, China added a population roughly equal to the current population of the United States. And since GDP is the aggregation of what individuals do, you get an awful lot of this as a statistical artifact. I will close by saying we've got to pay more attention to the interdependence, mutual benefit, shared responsibilities, opportunities for collaborative activity within a global system. This isn't a U.S. doing China a favor, China doing a favor for the United States or trying to help out or squeeze out one another. It truly is a much more complicated picture than that. The opportunities abound, but one of the impediments to realizing them is excessive assertiveness on a Chinese side about what has been accomplished, how it has been accomplished, 
seeing more uniqueness and independent achievement than is warranted by its participation in the global system. And on the other side, whether it's Europe or Japan or the United States or the West, over-interpreting the balance beam here, that the rise of China, now India, Brazil, Indonesia, Turkey, as somehow being at the expense of and inimical to the interests of the countries that help make that possible. That's an unsustainable hypothesis, in my view, if one actually looks at the data, that we all have risen together. We can continue to rise together if we can be smart enough to avoid looking for clashes and contact and, and conflicts that don't exist or don't have to exist or training, transforming problems and issues into politically divisive clashes of civilization, ideological clashes. We're in a post-ideological period. We're in an integrated world. I'm very glad that China is a part of that global system. I'm glad as an American. I'm glad as somebody that studies China. We ought to look more forward to what we can do now that that has occurred and less looking backward with a, what are the downside and the negative things that have happened along the way because they're overwhelmingly outweighed by the positive. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Finger. Um, so our afternoon session, keynote session, is officially over now. Uh, our conference will be continued after a five minutes break. Uh, the panel on urbanization will be taking place in this room after five minutes break in Chinese. And the panel on information technology will be taking place in Half Mayor 309. So please follow the direction on the pamphlet. Thank you.